Here we go. So, you can isolate your questions. <laughs> yeah, see what happens? Uh, it's a superpower I have. <laughs> it's amazingly powerful. You know, if I want to just, you know, sneak, boom, done. I can, I can, think about how you could escape from anything. Cause other people to sneeze. They can't attack you, you know? Right? Think, huh? Uh? You've seen those Would You Rather? Yeah, they're funny. So, what one? Let's take a vote here. On the count of three, you're just going to say the number of the question that you had the most issues with. Pick one of them. One, one. I know you got excited over there. One. Pick the one question that you had the most issues with. One. On the count of three, you're going to say it. One, two, three. 39. 20? Who said 20? I'm hearing 20. Yeah, that's 20. It's a vote. Um, usually, you guys have done an amazing job at paralleling each other so far. It's been pretty good. So, um, number 20 said a spherical balloon. So let's get that homework sheet out here. Number 20. So a spherical balloon. How many people have seen that formula before? Four thirds pi r cubed. So it's not totally alien. It's not totally alien to some of you. You kind of seen it. You're expanding it from a radius of r to a radius of r plus 1. And it asks you, how much air do you need in order to do that? Essentially, they're asking you for what? What are they asking you for? Volume. The difference in um, volume? volume. The difference in volume between the sphere of radius r plus 1 and the sphere of radius r. So what's the first? Well, we know the sphere of radius r is the volume is 4 thirds pi r cubed. And there's some sort of unit here. One thing that's nice about math Units at the end, that's fine. You don't have to do what the phys uh, physicists do, which is units on every last little piece. That's okay. Teaching you some bad habits. What do we now need to find? The volume of the sphere with radius r plus 1. So that's 4 thirds pi times what? R plus 1. Cubed. So this question is asking you for the difference of these two things. So it's really just asking you for... Uh, v of r minus v of r plus 1. So that's going to be 4 thirds pi r cubed minus, or excuse me, which w w th that's not quite correct. What should it be? <coughs> r plus 1 minus, because you want to subtract the smaller from the larger. So you have 4 thirds pi r cubed, pi r plus 1 cubed, minus 4 thirds pi r cubed. You can, this now, that represents the answer they are looking for. You can simplify that a, whole, a little bit, but is it totally necessary? No. Here's what I would do. I would factor out things that are common to both terms. What's common to both terms? Four thirds pi. So you have four thirds pi times r plus one cubed minus r cubed. This would be totally fine. What else could you do if you really wanted to? <laughs> you could do the cube out. You could if you wanted to. Is that required at this point? Maybe you suspect it'll simplify really nicely. Sometimes when you have that trailing r cubed, it might collapse nicely. We can do it out just as an exercise here. You're going to end up with 4 thirds pi times r squared plus 2r plus 1 times r plus 1 minus r cubed. Where did I get the r squared plus 2r plus 1? What is that? Uh, r plus 1 squared. So now you keep going. It's not getting any prettier, but you hope it's going to collapse. You get r cubed plus 2r squared plus r plus r squared plus um, r cubed, sorry. Uh, no, r squared. r squared plus 2r plus 1 minus... Now, what's the phrase here? What do we, what do, we do at this point? You, you learned this in Algebra 1 when you first started working with variables. What are we doing at this point? It's called combine like terms. So some of them cancel straight out, and you end up with 4 thirds pi times, well, you have 2r squared and r squared, so you have 3 of them, 3r plus 1. At this point, that right there is a little better. You might ask yourself what at this point? What might you ask yourself? What do you always ask yourself when you're simplifying? Can you factor? Does it factor nicely? Anything is factorable. Not everything is factorable nicely. How do you check? What's the easiest way to check to see if something is factorable nicely? You can just go testing it, but sometimes that's not the best way. 
Does anybody remember what you can check, especially with a quadratic? Yeah, there you go. Check this thing. What is this called? Just this thing. This has a special name. Discriminants. Yeah. If this is equal to zero, how many solutions does it have? One real solution. What happens if it's less than, what happens if it's greater than zero? No, greater than zero, sorry. Two real solutions. And what happens if it's less than zero? Two imaginary solutions. So are there any real solutions? No, no real. But there are two imaginary, that's correct. So let's take a look at this. What is the discriminant here? It's going to be 3 squared minus 4 times 3 times 1. That's what? So are there any real solutions? So it's not nicely factorable. So you could stop here as well. This is fine. What's what, you know, you could, what could you do at this point that arguably is nicer? What could you do if you wanted to? It's kind of going in reverse, but it eliminates... You, what could you do? Put the four-thirds back in. You could put the four-thirds back in, or you could factor a three out. These are all different ways of this, making something look a little different, but are we changing the overall value? No. So, for example, we could factor out a three, and it becomes four pi times r cubed plus r plus what? One-third. This is fine, too. They're all, at a certain point, sometimes when you look at two things, one of them is definitely simpler than the other. But at other times, is there anything concrete that makes one definitely simpler than the other in this case? No. It's by choice. Here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to get to a correct answer. Let's say you got to here, and then you blathered on for like 10 minutes trying to simplify it, and you made a ton of mistakes. I'd rather you stop there and be right than wander off and totally fall down a rabbit hole. You don't need to spend more than 10% of the problem simplifying. Do you understand that rate, what I mean by that? If it takes you two minutes to do the problem, spend 30 seconds at the most, 20 seconds, 10 seconds simplifying. But do the easy simplification. For me, I would probably stop there. That's what I would have stopped at. I don't like to multiply things out like r plus 1 cubed unless I absolutely have to. In general, things are much easier to deal with when they're in factored form. In general. Not always, but in general. So let's do, uh, I'm gonna, let's do the shouting technique. I like that. It's kind of fun. Think of, think of the second question. Or it can be the same question you picked before if we didn't cover it just now. On the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. 39. 39? Who voted for 39? Getting votes for 39? And now I can say everybody participated in my class today. Isn't that pretty cool? <laughs> <laughs> Cheap ways to get easy metrics. Okay, 39. The bottom half of the parabola, x plus y minus 1 squared equals 0. Find an expression for the graph whose graph, function, whose graph is the given curve. So you have this. My guess is maybe none of you have dealt with something that looks like that. Is that a function? It's not, but you don't, you don't really know that yet. You, you know it's not if you graph this, but I'd imagine most of you haven't graphed it if it's just in this form. If you take more math classes, you will get better at just being able to look at this and going, oh yeah, I, I know what that looks like. It is a parabola, to tell you that. How would you go about attacking this? How would you go about examining this? Can someone raise there and tell me, what, what could you do to this thing? Why does this look different? What is it not? What form is it not in? It's not in any, any sort of standard form. So if you wanted to put this in quote-unquote standard form, what would we need to do? We want to what? Does it, why doesn't this look like any function we've seen before? So usually, what, what form are functions that we see? What, function, what form are they in? What? Like slope-intercept if it's a line, but what goes on one side and what goes on the other? Y is on the left, and what's, is there anything else on the right? Everything else. So what's on the left? And what's on the right? Everything else. So what, if we, what do we need to do? Put Y on the left. Well, we need to... Y, 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 y. We need to isolate Y. There we go. It's a fun game of charades where I can talk. 
If we want to isolate Y, what's the first thing we should do? Someone raise their hand. What's the first thing we should do? Just give me a hint here. Uh, let's go, Salmon. Sure. Perfectly legal. No drawbacks. No complications. We want to isolate Y. So what should we do at this point? Someone new. Someone raise. Tell me. What should I do? Yeah. Multi multiply out? Yeah. You can do that. Here's the problem. What's or the problem? Take, oh, no, no, no. Ah, or you could just take the square root. So we have y minus 1 is equal to? Sure. Now what do we do? There is a problem. What's the problem? Okay, so what's the domain of this? X has to be X has to be less than or equal to zero. Yeah, sure. So we know that that has to be less than or equal to zero. Sure. This is not the entire graph, though. That's a function. What we started with wasn't a function. I'm just telling you that. Something's missing. Ah, there's plus or minus. Why, why do we put the plus or minus in, and where do we put it in? Yeah, you have to put it in right there. Can you tell me why, Corey? Yeah, when you take the square root of something, you have to consider both cases. We are adding in square root. What's the, if I ask you, what is the square root of 4, what's your answer? That's not correct. Plus or minus 2. What is the square root of 9? But if I write this on a paper, what's the answer to that? Just 3. What's this? When it's written down, when the root is already there, where the radical sign is already there, you only take the principal root, which is the positive one, unless there's a negative sign in front of it. Point being, when you add in the square root, what do you have to add in? Plus or minus. So at this point, you end up with two functions. You end up with this one, and you end up with, what's the other one? Negative plus one. Let's use a calculator. Oh, convenient, it's already graphed. Those are the two functions, and we graphed, oh, what is it? Is it a parabola? Yes. Well, it told you that, so it better be, right? What kind of parabola is it? It's a sideways parabola. Usually you see it going up and down, right? Is this a function? Nope, not a function. Why? Thank you. Does not pass the vertical line test. The question now is, which graph is which? I'll tell you this. One of these functions is the upper one, and one of them is the bottom one. How would you go about figuring out which one's the upper and which one's the lower? You can do it in a very concrete way. I'll give you a hint. Do, any, do these functions share any points? One. Yeah, it shares one, but let's ignore that one point. So it just shares one. There's the upper half, and there's the lower half. So test, um, test points! Test points. What's one point on the bottom one that it goes through? You can actually see it there. It's this point right here. Yeah, it's negative one zero. Which one goes through negative one zero? Let's try up here. Negative, negative one, plus one. What's that equal to? Two. Two. Negative, negative, negative one, plus one. What's that? Zero. So which one is it? That one. So this question is asking you, find an expression for the graph, for the function whose graph is the given curve, the bottom half of this parabola, so which one's the bottom half? That one right there. So what's the answer to this question? That right there. Negative square root of negative x plus 1 is the bottom half of that parabola. And what's the domain? The domain for both is the same, right? You can't plug in a positive x value because then you'd be taking the square root of a negative number. What's the number inside the radical sign called? What's this called? Anybody know? It's rad what? Good for you. Gold star. High five. Ready, ready. We gotta time it though, right? One, two, three. There we go. Okay. <laughs> I really gotta get those gold stars. You know you'd like getting gold stars, right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, last class I gave out a Vanity Fair, so I gotta get a gold star for this thing. Um, We'll do one more. Do you, do you all have one more you'd like to talk about? What do you think? Think of, think of the number. I'll give you a couple seconds. Think of the number. Yes. 
Are there any others you'd like to talk about, or we're going to move on? I think we can move on pretty shortly. You got a number? One, two, three. <laughs> You're supposed to, so no? Okay, that's it then. Put the homework away. We're talking about new stuff. All right. Symmetry. So we're going to start with our big kid definitions because we love our big kid definitions. Here it is. A function f satisfies f of negative x equals f of x for every number x in its domain, then f, so this is if, sorry, if, then f is called an even function. So what does this mean? You have a function f of x, you plug in negative x, and you get out f of x. So effectively, what has happened to the function? What? What did you say? I can't hear you. No, there's not. we don't know what the function is. This could be anything. But look, we're taking a value of x, we're plugging it into a function, and when we get out, we get out f of x. We get, the, we, we get out what we started with. So what has happened to the function? Uh, I don't know how to say that in English, but the graph looks like a butterfly. Uh, yes, you're talking about the structure. We'll get there. But I'm trying to get you to say a really simple word. I'm not asking you to find something complicated here. You're plugging in negative x, and what you get out is what you started with. So you started with f of x, and you ended up with f of x. So what has happened? Nothing. Thank you. Nothing. You plug in negative x and get out the original function. So what happened? Nothing happened. This means that every time you plug in x, you get the same thing out as if you plugged in negative x. So if let's say you plugged in 7 and you got out 12. If you know the function is even, when you plug in negative 7, what do you get out? 12. Let's say the function is even and you plug in 8 and you get out 15. What happens when you plug in negative 8? 15. You get the same thing out if x is positive or negative. What does this look like visually? It looks like this. Looks like this. When you plug in x, what do you get out? f of x. When you plug in negative x, you get out f of negative x. But how high up are those numbers? It's the same horizontal line. So when you plug in x and negative x, you get out the same thing. This is an even function. It means it's symmetric over what? The y-axis. If you fold this over the y-axis, what do you get? What happens to the function? It, it covers it itself completely. You can fold this function over the y-axis, and it overlaps completely. Here's the simplest. Well, here's one very simple even function. How would you prove that x squared is an even function? What do you plug in for x? What do you plug in for x? Not a number. Negative x. Well, f of negative x is going to be negative x squared, which is negative x times negative x, which is, and that's equal to what? f of x. So what did we just show? f of negative x is equal to, so therefore, you see those three dots, everybody? That means therefore. Mathematicians love to shorten note common words. Therefore what? f of x is even. What about this function? Well, what's g of negative x? Negative x to the fourth plus negative x minus 3. What does that simplify to? x to the? plus, mm-hmm, but what's that equal to? So therefore it's even. Let's change it up just a little bit. Say it was n of x is equal to x to the fourth minus x cubed plus 1. So we do n of negative x and you end up with x to the minus negative x cubed plus 1. That's going to be x to the fourth plus x cubed plus 1. That does not equal to n of x, so this is not even. 
what might you think that means the function is? Ah, you think of e even and odd in terms of integers. If an integer is not even, it has to be. Is that true for functions? No. no. So the real question is, what's the next question we're going to cover? What's an odd function? <sighs> If a function satisfies f of negative x equals negative f of x for every number x in its domain, then f is a an odd function. Every number. So what happens if this fails for one number? It's not an odd function. It has to work for all of them. All of them. So is it pretty easy to prove something is not even or odd? Yeah, because how many, how many counterexamples do you need to prove something is not even or odd? How many? Just one. Just one. Proving something is not true is generally easier than proving something is true. You'll find that. In, in the world of math. It's kind of frustrating because it seems like you just tear down stuff and it's very hard to build it up. What does this mean? Well, let's go back to this sentence. When you plug in negative x, what happens to the function? When you plug in negative x, what happens to the function? The whole function what? The whole fun I speak louder so that humans can hear you. So that what? Yeah, the whole function becomes negative. That's it, yeah. What does this look like visually? Right here. It means that if I take this, this, this distance here, which is x, and I evaluate it, it comes up to f of x. But if I go back to negative f of x, how far down do you go? That has to be, what does this distance have to be equal to right here? Negative f of x. So we know that negative f of x has to equal f of negative x. That's the definition of odd functions. So, my, so here's, here's what I'm getting at. This point right here, if this point is a, b, can you tell me what that point is right there? Negative a, negative b. Going back up to the even functions, what, where is it? Right there. If this point here is AB, what's this fun point right there? Positive B, right? You just make A negative. So this is, means symmetric over the y-axis. That's really important to know. So over here, is this symmetric over an axis? No. no. Does anybody know what it's symmetric over? Raise your hand. Symmetric over, anybody know? Yeah. The, uh, why, uh, close, but no, that's inverse functions, which oh, we'll get no. to later. Zero. Yeah? Zero? The origin. Yeah, you're, you're, you slid towards it. That was good. Symmetric over the origin. What does that mean? It means that you can rotate the whole graph 180 degrees around the origin, and what will happen? It'll be the same graph. Where does the pin go? Right there. If you pl put that pin right there and spun this 180 degrees, what would you end up with? The same exact thing. The same exact thing. So what about something like this? How would you test to see if this is odd or even? What do you always plug in if you're testing if something is odd or even? You're always plugging in negative, negative x, no matter what. Plug in negative x, and you end up with negative x to the fifth. Are the parentheses kind of important? Yeah. And that's equal to x to the fifth, negative x to the fifth, minus what? Minus. What can I factor out of each of those? Well, actually, let's just factor out the negative. Sorry, you can factor out an x, but you end up with x to the fifth plus x cubed plus x. What's that equal? Negative h of x. So what have we shown? h of negative x is equal to negative h of x. So h of x is, is odd. The punchline, though, is this. Let's say I gave you 
x to the fourth plus x to the third plus x squared minus 12. If I wanted to know if that's odd or even, what do you plug in for x? Negative x. You get j of negative x is equal to negative x to the fourth plus negative x cubed plus negative x squared minus 12 x to the fourth minus x cubed plus x squared minus 12. What does that not equal? It doesn't equal j of x, and it doesn't equal what? So what can you conclude? Yeah, not odd, not even. It is neither. So that's kind of uh, a brain cramp in a way, because you're so used to things being either odd or even. So in tune. You need to be careful with your algebra. Is it, if you lose one negative sign, can the whole thing blow up? Uh, yeah. The whole thing can blow up very, very, very quickly. It can go kaboom. We pretty good with this idea here? What happens if I uh, gave you something that looked like this? Is that odd or even? Neither. It's neither. If I wanted to make that even, what would I have to do? Yeah. That would be even, right? Could I do something differently to make it odd? Yeah, it's, it's, it, you'll get better at this. It's going to look something like, like that. Wait, what, the, um, the, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. This would be odd, and this would be... So you can make things, you can finish it. But how many points, if they're wrong, make it not odd or even? Oh, one, one. If you can find one point, one point. Okay, I want to cover the last topic for today. The idea of increasing and decreasing. I want to show you something and then have you look at it for a few minutes on your own and see if you can understand at least some of it on your own. I under, I, I'm confident that you, under, you can tell me where functions are increasing or decreasing. I want to give you some really good grown-up notation. So I want you to take a couple minutes and take a look at this and see if you can understand. Oops. Increasing and decreasing. Read that and take two minutes to see if you can understand it by yourself. So what do you think of this definition? Any thoughts? You have no thoughts. You have no independent thoughts of your own? Nothing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, what it's saying is, if the function is, de if it's increasing on an interval, this is true. Oh, whoa. If it's increasing on an interval, this is true. If it's decreasing on an interval, this is true. So, visually, this is what it means. On a number line, it's always saying that x1 is always going to be less than x2. So, what does that mean in terms of, if something is less than another thing, it has to be on the left or right? It has to be on the left. So what this thing is saying, if it's increasing, here's this point right here. That distance is going to be f of x1. This distance is going to be f of this right here. We're going to call this the interval i. We're going to call that the interval i. On that interval, it's increasing if any time you pick two values, one is less than the other, f of x1, which is less than x2, is going to be less than f of x2. Because if I connect these two, you're going to have to go up for any two values. A different interval i, though, let's say this is the interval right here. We have, again, we have an x1 and a x2. It's decreasing if f of x1 is greater than f of x2 everywhere in that i. 
So it's decreasing if for any two values you pick, the function value of the lesser one will be greater than the function value of the x2, the greater one, and vice versa. So this is the, this is the strict definition. In practice, in practice, is it a little easier just to see this? Sure. Everybody take out your calculator. Let's make something up. Let's have some fun with calculators. When I say your, na when I say your name, give me a number between 1 and 5. Um, Sophie. Eliza. Claire, not here. Sean. Five? I'll make it one half. And I'm going to finish this. Here's your first task. Graph this. Okay, well, I'm going to type it into the calculator. Can someone read it off to me? What is it? 2x what? To the fifth, yep. 3x to the fourth, yep. Minus 0.5 what? Yep. X to the third, right? Yep. Yep. Then what? Oh, no, no, no. Plus x squared? Take away 6. Here's the window I'm going to use. Negative 2 to 2 and negative 10 to 10. So, what could I now ask you about this function now that you have a nice picture of it? What could I ask you about this function? Sure. Is it even or odd? What do you think? Neither. Neither. Now what could I ask you? What was the last topic we just covered? <laughs> okay, use a sentence. What could I ask you? No. Well, it, where is it increasing? Where is it? So what would you need to find? Yeah, you need to find the maxes and mins. You need to find that point. You're not sure if that's on the axis or not. There's two of them you need to find. Use your calculator. Please do that now. So who wants to come up and show me how to find one of the maxes? Who can do it on their calculator? Bjorn, can you do it? Yes. There you go. I believe so. Stand over here and click like this on this side. So stand over here. There you go. Nope, don't hold it down. Just press where you want to do it. Second first, I think. Hit second the blue button on the calculator. Now hit trace. Which one do we want? Let's do maximum first. Yep. Enter. Okay, it's asking you for a... What's it asking you for? On the calculator screen, what's it asking you for? So move the cursor to the left of that highest point. You have to hit it multiple times. Oops. Oh, that's a new one. I've never seen that before. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's no way to hold it down. <laughs> so once you go to the left bound, what do you need to do? Well, actually, stop clicking. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back a little bit. You hit enter. Now what's it asking you for? Yep. Okay. Good. Good. I hit enter. Now what's it asking you for? What's your guess? So go to where the guess is, yep. And hit. Good. And it computes. Excellent. Good. Thank you, Bjorn. So if we clip this out, there's that maximum. What else do we need to find? Who wants to do the minimum? Anybody want to try? Try? Come on. So you don't need to press the button. Yep. 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 
minimum. Uh, mm -hmm. That's good. Yep. So the only thing you need to make sure is that you go past the minimum. If you're not sure where it is, just go past it. Keep on going. Don't go too hard. Do it one at a time. If you do it too fast, keep going. Slow down when you click. Keep going. All right, that's, uh, it looks like it's going up. Mm -hmm. <coughs> now go back to the guess. I, I think we don't have to do Guess? You don't have to, but I would like you to do what the calculator tells uh. you to do. You missed. Your hand is blocking the sensor. <laughs> see if you can do it. Okay, let me explain this, everybody. You see the line of sight right here? The camera? It has to be able to see the end of the pen. Do it slowly. And now we hit. Boom. Good. Thank you. Now, here's a question for you. Thank you. Yay. We're getting better. You have to be able to, you see this end of the light here? This little end of the pen? It has to see that. If it doesn't see that, it won't pick it up. Um, what's that number it has right there for the minimum? What's the X value? What is that? Yes, I understand you can read the decimal. What does that E negative 6 mean? It's not an error. It's times 10 to the negative 6. So that number is really close to what? Is it actually 0? Not really. It's really close to 0. So with this information, can you tell me where is this increasing? Someone raise their hand and tell me where is this increasing? Where is the function increasing? Looking at this from left to right, where is it increasing? Mm -hmm. So x is less than negative 1.407. Go to three decimal places. And where else? Greater than, well, let's make it exact. Negative 1.231 times... And where is this decreasing? Can someone tell me where it's decreasing? It's where it's less than negative 1.231 times 10 to the negative 6 and greater than what? Four zero. It's increasing here and here. And where is it decreasing? That's a bad, well, yeah, it's not bad. Does that make sense, everybody? How you use the minimum and maximum functions? What's another way you could write x is less than this? What's another way you could write that? Remember the set notation, everybody? Remember this from yesterday? That means negative infinity all the way up to but not including negative 1.407. And then what about this? How could you write this? in set notation, just like I wrote it. How would you write that one? Say it louder so I can hear you. Yep. Yep. Comma. Yep. That's correct, yeah. And then this one, leave it like that. That's fine. Should you make it equal to? No, because at those values, is it going up or down? Neither. It's not doing either. So let's make up another function. When I say your name, give me a number between 1 and 5. Um, Lawler. Brown. Your homework tonight is going to be to find where is this increasing and decreasing. And also, your homework is going to be from the packet from the packet those question numbers yay